The history of X-ray astronomy begins in the 1920s, with interest in short-wave communications for the U.S. Navy. This was soon followed by extensive study of the Earth's ionosphere. By 1927, interest in the detection of X-ray and ultraviolet UV radiation at high altitudes inspired researchers to launch Goddard's rockets into the upper atmosphere to support theoretical studies and data gathering. The first successful rocket flight equipped with instrumentation able to detect solar ultraviolet radiation occurred in 1946. X-ray solar studies began in 1949. By 1973 a solar instrument package orbited on Skylab providing significant solar data. In 1965 the Goddard Space Flight Center program in X-ray astronomy was initiated with a series of balloon-borne experiments. In the 1970s this was followed by high-altitude sounding rocket experiments, and that was followed by orbiting satellite observatories, the first rocket flight to successfully detect a cosmic source of X-ray emission was launched in 1962 by a group at American Science and Engineering &E. X-ray wavelengths reveal information about the body sources that emit them. Topic: 1920s to the 1940s. The Naval Research Laboratory (NRL) opened in 1923. After E. O. Hull Burt (1890–1982) arrived there in 1924, he studied physical optics. The NRL was conducting research on the properties of the ionosphere, Earth's reflecting layer, because of interest in short-wave radio communications. Hubert Hulbert, produced a series of mathematical descriptions of the ionosphere during the 1920s and 1930s. In 1927, at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, Hulbert, Gregory Bright and Merle Tuve explored the possibility of equipping Robert Goddard's rockets to explore the upper atmosphere. In 1929 Hulbert proposed an experimental program in which a rocket might be instrumented to explore the upper atmosphere. This proposal included detection of ultraviolet radiation and X rays at high altitudes. Herbert Friedman began X ray solar studies in 1949 and soon reported that the energy of the solar X-ray spectrum is adequate to account for all of E-layer ionization." Thus one of Hulbert's original questions, the source and behavior of the radio reflecting layer, began to find its answer in space research. At the end of the 1930s, other studies included the inference of an X ray corona by optical methods and, in 1949, more direct evidence by detecting X ray photons. Because the Earth's atmosphere blocks X rays at ground level, Wilhelm Röntgen's discovery had no effect on observational astronomy for the first. 50 years. X-ray astronomy became possible only with the capability to use rockets that far exceeded the altitudes of balloons. In 1948 U.S. researchers used a German-made V-2 rocket to gather the first records of solar X-rays. The NRL has placed instruments in rockets, satellites, Skylab, and Spacelab 2 through the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. 
The sensitivity of detectors increased greatly during the 60 years of X-ray astronomy. In addition, the ability to focus X-rays has developed enormously, allowing the production of high-quality images. 1960s The study of astronomical objects at the highest energies of X-rays and gamma rays began in the early 1960s. Before then, scientists knew only that the Sun was an intense source in these wavebands. Earth's atmosphere absorbs most X-rays and gamma rays, so rocket flights that could lift scientific payloads above Earth's atmosphere were needed. The first rocket flight to successfully detect a cosmic source of X-ray emission was launched in 1962 by a group at American Science and Engineering the team of scientists on this project included Ricardo Giacconi, Herbert Gursky, Frank Paolini, and Bruno Rossi. This rocket flight used a small X-ray detector, which found a very bright source they named Scorpius X-1, because it was the first X-ray source found in the constellation Scorpius. topic 1970s In the 1970s, dedicated X-ray astronomy satellites such as Uhuru, Ariel 5, SAS-3, OS-08 and Heiau-1 developed this field of science at an astounding pace. Scientists hypothesized that X-rays from stellar sources in our galaxy were primarily from a neutron star in a binary system with a normal star. In these X-ray binaries, the X-rays originate from material traveling from the normal star to the neutron star in a process called accretion. The binary nature of the system allowed astronomers to measure the mass of the neutron star. For other systems, the inferred mass of the X-ray emitting object supported the idea of the existence of black holes, as they were too massive to be neutron stars. Other systems displayed a characteristic X-ray pulse, just as pulsars had been found to do in the radio regime, which allowed a determination of the spin rate of the neutron star. Finally, some of these galactic X-ray sources were found to be highly variable. In fact, some sources would appear in the sky, remain bright for a few weeks, and then fade again from view. Such sources are called X-ray transients. The inner regions of some galaxies were also found to emit X-rays. The X-ray emission from these active galactic nuclei is believed to originate from ultra-relativistic gas near a very massive black hole at the galaxy's center. Lastly, a diffuse X-ray emission was found to exist all over the sky. 1980s to the present. The study of X-ray astronomy continued to be carried out using data from a host of satellites that were active from the 1980s to the early 2000s, the Heiau program, EXOSAT, Jinja, RXTE, ROSAT, ASCA, as well as BEPOSIX, which detected the first afterglow of a gamma ray burst GRB. Data from these satellites continues to aid our further understanding of the nature of these sources and the mechanisms by which the X-rays and gamma rays are emitted. 
Understanding these mechanisms can in turn shed light on the fundamental physics of our universe. By looking at the sky with X-ray and gamma-ray instruments, we collect important information in our attempt to address questions such as how the universe began and how it evolves, and gain some insight into its eventual fate. Goddard Space Flight Center Balloons <inaudible> 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 In 1965, at the suggestion of Frank McDonald, Elihu Bolt initiated Goddard's program in X-ray astronomy with a series of balloon-borne experiments. At an early stage he was joined by Peter Serlomitsos, who had just completed his Ph.D. space physics thesis on magnetospheric electrons, and by Genta Riegler, a University of Maryland physics graduate student interested in doing his dissertation research in astrophysics. From 1965 to 1972 there were over a dozen balloon-borne experiments mostly from New Mexico, including the first such to take place from Australia 1966, one in which hard X-ray emission was discovered albeit with crude angular resolution from a region towards the galactic center whose centroid is located among subsequently identified sources GX1 plus 4, GX3 plus 1, and GX5 minus 1. A balloon-borne experiment in 1968 was based on the multi-anode multi-layer xenon gas proportional chamber that had recently been developed in our lab and represented the first use of such a high-performance instrument for X-ray astronomy. Due to the attenuation of soft X-rays by the residual atmosphere at balloon altitudes these early experiments were restricted to energies above approximately 20 keV. Observations down to lower energies were begun with a series of high altitude sounding rocket experiments, by this stage Steve Holt had already joined the program. A 1972 rocket-borne observation of Cas A, the youngest supernova remnant in our galaxy, yielded the first detection of an X-ray spectral line, iron K-line emission at approximately 7 keV. <laughs> Rockets The figure to the right shows 15 second samples of the raw counts per 20.48 milliseconds observed in a 1973 sounding rocket borne exposure to three of the X ray brightest binary sources in our galaxy her X1 1.7 days, CYGX3 0.2 day and CYGX1 5.6 days. The 1.24 second pulsar period associated with her X1 is immediately evident from the data, while the rate profile for CYGX3 is completely consistent with the statistical fluctuations in counts expected for a source that is constant, at least for the 15s duration of the exposure shown. The CYGX1 data, on the other hand, clearly exhibit the chaotic shot noise behavior characteristic of this black hole candidate and also provided preliminary evidence for the additional feature of millisecond burst substructure noted for the first time in this observation 
the sharp cutoff at approximately 24 keV in the flat spectrum observed for her X1 in this exposure provided the first reported evidence for radiative transfer effects to be associated with a highly magnetized plasma near the surface of a neutron star. The black body spectral component observed for CYGX3 during this experiment gave strong evidence that this emission is from the immediate vicinity of a compact object the size of a neutron star. An observation of CYGX3 a year later with the same instrument yielded an optically thin thermal spectrum for this source and provided the first evidence for strong spectral ion K line emission from an X ray binary. <laughs> Orbiting observatories Our large area PCA proportional counter array on the current RXTE Rossi X-ray timing explorer mission genuinely reflects the heritage of our sounding rocket program. RXTE continues to provide very valuable data as it enters the second decade of successful operation. Goddard's ASM All Sky Monitor Pinhole X-ray Camera on Aerial 5 (1974–1980) was the first X-ray astronomy experiment to use imaging proportional counters, albeit one-dimensional. It provided information on transient sources and the long-term behavior of several bright objects. Gene Swank joined the program in time for the beginning of our OS08 experiment 1975 the first broadband orbiting observatory based on multi-anode multi-layer proportional chambers, one that showed the power of X-ray spectroscopy, for example, it established that iron K-line emission is a ubiquitous feature of clusters of galaxies, the Heyau 1A2 Full Sky Cosmic X-ray Experiment 1977 provided the most comprehensive data still the most definitive on the cosmic X-ray background broadband spectrum and large-scale structure, and a much-used complete sample of the brightest extragalactic sources, it posed the challenging spectral paradox", just now being unraveled with new results on evolution from deep surveys and on individual source spectra extending into the gamma-ray band. The SSS solid state spectrometer at the focus of the Heyau 2 Einstein Observatory 1978 to 1981 Grazing Incidence Telescope was the first high spectral resolution non-dispersive spectrometer to be used for X-ray astronomy here for energies up to approximately 3 keV limited by the telescope optics by the use of conical foil optics, developed in our lab, the response of a grazing incidence X-ray telescope was extended to 12 keV, amply covering the crucial iron K band of emission. A cooled C solid-state detector was used at the focus of such a telescope for the BBXRT broadband X-ray telescope on the Astro-1 shuttle mission STS-35 on Columbia in December 1990. The first broadband 0.3-12 keV X-ray observatory to use focusing optics. In collaboration with X-ray astronomers in Japan, Goddard supplied conical foil X-ray optics have been used for the joint Japanese and American ASCA mission 1993 It was the first broadband imaging observatory using CCD non-dispersive spectrometers. 
substantial improvement in the capability of solid-state non-dispersive spectrometers has been achieved in our lab in collaboration with the University of Wisconsin by the successful development of quantum calorimeters with resolution better than 10 electron volts FWHM. Such spectrometers have been used in a sounding rocket-borne experiment to study spectral lines from the hot interstellar medium of our galaxy and will soon play a major role in the joint Japanese-American Suzaku orbiting X-ray observatory launched in July 2005. The critical early stages of this program benefited from highly dedicated technical support by Dale Arbogast, Frank Bursa, Ciro Cancro, Upendra Desai, Henry Doong, Charles Glasser, Sid Jones, and Frank Schaffer. More than 20 graduate students mostly from the University of Maryland at College Park have successfully carried out their Ph.D. dissertation research within our X-ray astronomy program. Almost all of these former students have remained actively involved with astrophysics. Early research Topic: The USA V2 period The beginning of the search for X-ray sources from above the Earth's atmosphere was on August 5, 1948, 12:07 Greenwich Mean Time. A U.S. Army V-2 as part of Project Hermes was launched from White Sands Proving Grounds Launch Complex LC-33. In addition to carrying experiments of the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory for cosmic and solar radiation, temperature, pressure, ionosphere, and photography, there was on board a solar X-ray test detector, which functioned properly. The missile reached an apogee of 166 km. As part of a collaboration between the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory and the Signal Corps Engineering Laboratory of the University of Michigan, another V-2 configuration was launched from White Sands LC-33 on December 9, 1948 at 1608 Greenwich Mean Time, 908 local time. The missile reached an apogee of 108.7 km and carried aeronomy winds, pressure, temperature, solar X-ray and radiation, and biology experiments. On January 28, 1949, an NRL X-ray detector Blossom was placed in the nose cone of a V-2 rocket and launched at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. X-rays from the Sun were detected. Apogee, 60 km. A second collaborative effort NRL, SCEL, using a V2UM3 configuration launched on April 11, 1949 at 22.05 Greenwich Mean Time. Experiments included solar X-ray detection, apogee, 87.4 km, NRL ionosphere 1 solar X-ray, ionosphere, meteorite mission launched a V-2 on September 29, 1949 from White Sands at 1658 Greenwich Mean Time and reached 151.1 km, using V-250 
2003 configuration a solar X-ray experiment was launched on February 17, 1950 from White Sands LC-33 at 1801 Greenwich Mean Time reaching an apogee of 148 km, the last V-2 launch number TF-2. TF3 came on August 22, 1952, 7:33 Greenwich Mean Time from White Sands, reaching an apogee of 78.2 km and carried experiments: solar X-ray for NRL, cosmic radiation for the National Institute of Health (NIH), and Sky Brightness for the Air Research and Development Command. Topic: Aerobe period. The first successful launch of an Aerobe occurred on May 5, 1952, 13:44 Greenwich Mean Time from White Sands Proving Grounds Launch Complex LC-35. It was an Aerobe RTVN-10 configuration reaching an apogee of 127 km with NRL experiments for solar X-ray and ultraviolet detection. On April 19, 1960, an Office of Naval Research Aerobe High made a series of X-ray photographs of the Sun from an altitude of 208 km. The mainstay of the USIGY rocket stable was the Aerobe High, which was modified and improved to create the Aerobe 150. An Aerobe 150 rocket launched on June 12, 1962 detected the first X-rays from other celestial sources Scorpius X-1. Topic: USSR V2 derivative launches. Starting on June 21, 1959, from Kapustin Yar, with a modified V2 designated the R5V, the USSR launched a series of four vehicles to detect solar X-rays: a R2A on July 21, 1959, and two R11A at 2 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time and 1400 Greenwich Mean Time. Topic Skylark. The British Skylark was probably the most successful of the many sounding rocket programs. The first launched in 1957 from Woomera, Australia, and its 441st and final launch took place from Esrange, Sweden, on the 2nd of May 2005. Launches were carried out from sites in Australia, Europe, and South America, with use by NASA, the European Space Research Organization and German and Swedish space organizations. Skylark was used to obtain the first good quality X-ray images of the solar corona, the first X-ray surveys of the sky in the Southern Hemisphere were provided by Skylark launches. It was also used with high precision in September and October 1972 in an effort to locate the optical counterpart of X-ray source GX3 plus 1 by lunar occultation. Veronique 
The French Véronique was successfully launched on April 14, 1964 from Hamagira, L.C. Blandine carrying experiments to measure UV and X-ray intensities and the FU-110 to measure UV intensity from the atomic H Lyman Alpha line, and again on November 4, 1964. Topic: Early satellites. The Solar Radiation Satellite Program (SOLRAD) was conceived in the late 1950s to study the sun's effects on Earth, particularly during periods of heightened solar activity. SOLRAD-1 was launched on June 22, 1960 aboard a Thor Abel from Cape Canaveral at 1.54 am Eastern Daylight Saving Time. As the world's first orbiting astronomical observatory, SOLRADI determined that radio fade outs were caused by solar X ray emissions, the first in a series of eight successfully launched orbiting solar observatories, OS01, launched on March 7, 1963, had as its primary mission to measure solar electromagnetic radiation in the UV. X-ray, and gamma-ray regions. The first USA satellite which detected cosmic X-rays was the Third Orbiting Solar Observatory, or OSO-3, launched on March 8, 1967. It was intended primarily to observe the Sun, which it did very well during its two-year lifetime, but it also detected a flaring episode from the source SCO X1 and measured the diffuse cosmic X-ray background. OS05 was launched on January 22, 1969, and lasted until July 1975. It was the fifth satellite put into orbit as part of the Orbiting Solar Observatory program. This program was intended to launch a series of nearly identical satellites to cover an entire 11-year solar cycle. The circular orbit had an altitude of 555 km and an inclination of 33 degrees. The spin rate of the satellite was 1.8 s. The data produced a spectrum of the diffuse background over the energy range 14 to 200 keV. OS06 was launched on August 9, 1969. Its orbital period was approximately 95 minutes. The spacecraft had a spin rate of 0.5 rps. On board was a hard X-ray detector, 27 to 189 keV, with a 5.1 square centimeters TL scintillator, collimated to 17 degrees times 23 degrees F WHM. The system had four energy channels separated 27497511818189 keV. The detector spun with the spacecraft on a plane containing the sun direction within plus or minus 3.5 degrees. Data were read with alternate 70 milliseconds and 30 milliseconds integrations for five intervals every 320 ms. TD1A was put in a nearly circular polar sun synchronous orbit, with apogee 545 km, perigee 533 km, and inclination 97.6 degrees. It was ESRO's first three-axis stabilized satellite, with one axis pointing to the Sun to within plus or minus 5 degrees. The optical axis was maintained perpendicular to the solar pointing axis and to the orbital plane. 
it scanned the entire celestial sphere every six months, with a great circle being scanned every satellite revolution. After about two months of operation, both of the satellite's tape recorders failed. A network of ground stations was put together so that real-time telemetry from the satellite was recorded for about 60% of the time. After six months in orbit, the satellite entered a period of regular eclipses as the satellite passed behind the Earth cutting off sunlight to the solar panels. The satellite was put into hibernation for four months, until the eclipse period passed, after which systems were turned back on and another six months of observations were made. TD-1A was primarily a UV mission however it carried both a cosmic X-ray and a gamma-ray detector. TD-1A re-entered on January 9, 1980. <inaudible> <inaudible> Surveying and cataloging X-ray sources OS-07 was primarily a solar observatory designed to point a battery of UV and X-ray telescopes at the Sun from a platform mounted on a cylindrical wheel. The detectors for observing cosmic X-ray sources were X-ray proportional counters. The hard X-ray telescope operated over the energy range 7 to 550 keV. OS07 performed an X-ray all-sky survey and discovered the nine-day periodicity in Vela X1 which led to its optical identification as a HMXRB. OS-07 was launched on September 29, 1971 and operated until May 18, 1973. Skylab, a science and engineering laboratory, was launched into Earth orbit by a Saturn V rocket on May 14, 1973. Detailed X-ray studies of the Sun were performed. The S-150 experiment performed a faint X-ray source survey. The S-150 was mounted atop the SIVB upper stage of the Saturn 1B rocket which orbited briefly behind and below Skylab on July 28, 1973. The entire SIVB stage underwent a series of pre-programmed maneuvers, scanning about 1 degree every 15 seconds, to allow the instrument to sweep across selected regions of the sky. The pointing direction was determined during data processing, using the inertial guidance system of the SIVB stage combined with information from two visible star sensors which formed part of the experiment. Galactic X-ray sources were observed with the S-150 experiment. The experiment was designed to detect 4.0 to 10.0 nanometers photons. It consisted of a single large, approximately 1,500 square centimeters proportional counter, electrically divided by fine wire ground planes into separate signal collecting areas and looking through collimator veins. The collimators defined three intersecting fields of view approximately 2 times 20 degrees on the sky, which allowed source positions to be determined to approximately 30. The front window of the instrument consisted of a 2 micrometers thick plastic sheet. The counter gas was a mixture of argon and methane. 
Analysis of the data from the S-150 experiment provided strong evidence that the soft X-ray background cannot be explained as the cumulative effect of many unresolved point sources. Skylab's solar studies, UV and X-ray solar photography for highly ionized atoms, X-ray spectrography of solar flares and active regions, and X-ray emissions of lower solar corona. Salyut 4 space station was launched on December 26, 1974. It was in an orbit of 355 times 343 km, with an orbital period of 91.3 minutes, inclined at 51.6 degrees. The X-ray telescope began observations on January 15, 1975. Orbiting Solar Observatory was launched on June 21, 1975. While OSO8's primary objective was to observe the Sun, four instruments were dedicated to observations of other celestial X-ray sources brighter than a few millicrab. A sensitivity of 0001 of the Crab Nebula source equals 1 McCrab OS08 ceased operations on October 1st 1978 equals topic x-ray source variability equals Although several earlier X-ray observatories initiated the endeavor to study X-ray source variability, once the catalogues of X-ray sources were firmly established, more extensive studies could commence. Prognose 6 carried two Ni TL scintillators, 2 to 511 keV, 2.2 to 98 keV, and a proportional counter, 2.2 to 7 keV, to study solar X-rays. The Space Test Program spacecraft P-78-1 or Solwind was launched on February 24, 1979 and continued operating until September 13, 1985, when it was shot down in orbit during an Air Force ASM-135 ASAT test. The platform was of the Orbiting Solar Observatory OSO type, with a solar-oriented sail and a rotating wheel section. P-78-1 was in a noon-midnight, sun-synchronous orbit at 600 km altitude. The orbital inclination of 96 degrees implied that a substantial fraction of the orbit was spent at high latitude, where the particle background prevented detector operation. In-flight experience showed that good data were obtained between 35 degrees north and 35 degrees south geomagnetic latitude outside the South Atlantic anomaly. This yields an instrument duty cycle of 25 to 30%. Telemetry data were obtained for about 40 to 50% of the orbits, yielding a net data return of 10 to 15%. Though this data rate appears low, it means that about 108 seconds of good data reside in the XMON database. Data from the P-78-1 X-ray monitor experiment offered source monitoring with a sensitivity comparable to that of instruments flown on SAS-3, OS-08, or Hakucho, and the advantages of longer observing times and unique temporal coverage. Five fields of inquiry were particularly well suited for investigation with P-78-1 data 
study of pulsational, eclipse, precession, and intrinsic source variability on time scales of tens of seconds to months in galactic X-ray sources Pulse timing studies of neutron stars Identification and study of new transient sources Observations of X-ray and gamma-ray bursts, and other fast transients Simultaneous X-ray coverage of objects observed by other satellites, such as Heyau 2 and 3, as well as bridging the gap in coverage of objects in the observational timeline, launched on February 21, 1981. The Hinatori satellite observations of the 1980s pioneered hard X-ray imaging of solar flares. Tenma was the second Japanese X-ray astronomy satellite launched on February 20, 1983. Tenma carried GSFC detectors which had an improved energy resolution by a factor of two compared to proportional counters and performed the first sensitive measurements of the iron spectral region for many astronomical objects. Energy range, 0.1 to 60 keV, gas scintillator proportional counter, 10 units of 80 square centimeters each, FOV approximately 3 degrees, FWHM, 2 to 60 keV, transient source monitor, 2 to 10 keV. The Soviet Astron orbital station was designed primarily for UV and X-ray astrophysical observations. It was injected into orbit on March 23, 1983. The satellite was put into a highly elliptical orbit, approximately 200,000 times 2,000 km. The orbit kept the craft far away from the Earth for 3.5 out of every four days. It was outside of the Earth's shadow and radiation belts for 90% of the time. The second major experiment, SKR-02M, aboard Astron was an X-ray spectrometer, which consisted of a proportional counter sensitive to 2 to 25 keV X-rays, with an effective area of 0.17 square meters. The FOV was 3 degrees times 3 degrees FWHM. Data could be telemetered in 10 energy channels. The instrument began taking data on April 3, 1983. Spacelab 1 was the first Spacelab mission in orbit in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle STS between November 28 and December 8, 1983. An X-ray spectrometer, measuring 2 to 30 keV photons although 2 to 80 keV was possible, was on the pallet. The primary science objective was to study detailed spectral features in cosmic sources and their temporal changes. The instrument was a gas scintillation proportional counter GSPC with approximately 180 square centimeters area and energy resolution of 9% at 7 keV. The detector was collimated to a 4.5 degrees FWHM FOV. There were 512 energy channels. Spartan-1 was deployed from the Space Shuttle Discovery on June 20, 1985 and retrieved 45.5 hours later. The X-ray detectors aboard the Spartan platform were sensitive to the energy range 1–12 keV. The instrument scanned its target with narrowly collimated 5 feet times 3 degrees GSPCs. 
there were two identical sets of counters, each having approximately 660 square centimeters effective area. Counts were accumulated for 0.812 s into 128 energy channels. The energy resolution was 16% at 6 keV. During its two days of flight, Spartan 1 observed the Perseus cluster of galaxies and the galactic center region. Ginger was launched on February 5, 1987. The primary instrument for observations was the Large Area Proportional Counter the European Retrievable Carrier EURECA was launched July 31, 1992 by the Space Shuttle Atlantis, and put into an orbit at an altitude of 508 km. It began its scientific mission on August 7, 1992. EURECA was retrieved on July 1, 1993 by the Space Shuttle Endeavour and returned to Earth. On board was the Watch or Wide Angle Telescope for Cosmic Hard X-rays instrument. The Watch instrument was sensitive to 6 to 150 keV photons. The total field of view covered one quarter of the celestial sphere. During its 11-month lifetime, EURECA tracked the Sun and watch gradually scanned across the entire sky. Some two dozen known X-ray sources were monitored—some for more than 100 days—and a number of new X-ray transients were discovered. The Diffused X-ray Spectrometer DXS STS-54 package was flown as an attached payload in January, 1993 to obtain spectra of the diffuse soft X-ray background. DXS obtained the first ever high-resolution spectra of the diffuse soft X-ray background in the energy band from 0.15 to 0.28 keV (4.3 to 8.4 nanometers). Topic X1 X-ray sources. As all sky surveys are performed and analyzed or once the first extrasolar X-ray source in each constellation is confirmed, it is designated X1, e.g., Scorpius X1 or Sco X1. There are 88 official constellations. Often the first X-ray source is a transient. As X-ray sources have been better located, many of them have been isolated to extragalactic regions such as the Large Magellanic Cloud When there are often many individually discernible sources, the first one identified is usually designated as the extragalactic source X1, e.g., Small Magellanic Cloud SMC X1, HMXRB, at 01H 15m 14s minus 73 hours 42 minutes 22 seconds. These early X-ray sources still are studied and often produce significant results. For example, Serpens X1. As of August 27, 2007 discoveries concerning asymmetric iron line broadening and their implications for relativity have been a topic of much excitement. With respect to the asymmetric iron line broadening, Edward Cackett of the University of Michigan commented, "...we're seeing the gas whipping around just outside the neutron star's surface." 
and since the inner part of the disk obviously can't orbit any closer than the neutron star's surface, these measurements give us a maximum size of the neutron star's diameter. The neutron stars can be no larger than 18 to 20.5 miles across, results that agree with other types of measurements. We've seen these asymmetric lines from many black holes, but this is the first confirmation that neutron stars can produce them as well. It shows that the way neutron stars accrete matter is not very different from that of black holes, and it gives us a new tool to probe Einstein's theory says Todd Stromayer of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. This is fundamental physics, says Sudip Bhattacharya also of NASA's in Greenbelt, Maryland and the University of Maryland. There could be exotic kinds of particles or states of matter, such as quark matter, in the centers of neutron stars, but it's impossible to create them in the lab. The only way to find out is to understand neutron stars. Using XMM Newton, Bhattacharya and Stromayer observed Serpens X1, which contains a neutron star and a stellar companion. Cackett and John Miller of the University of Michigan, along with Bhattacharya and Stromayer, used Suzaku's superb spectral capabilities to survey Serpens X1. The Suzaku data confirmed the XMM Newton result regarding the iron line in Serpens X1. Topic: <laughs> X-ray source catalogs. Catalogues of X-ray sources have been put together for a variety of purposes including chronology of discovery, confirmation by X-ray flux measurement, initial detection, and X-ray source type. <laughs> Sounding rocket X-ray source catalogues One of the first catalogues of X-ray sources published came from workers at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory in 1966 and contained 35 X-ray sources. Of these only 22 had been confirmed by 1968. An additional astronomical catalogue of discrete X-ray sources over the celestial sphere by constellation contains 59 sources as of December 1, 1969, that at the least had an X-ray flux published in the literature. Early X-ray observatory satellite catalogues Each of the major observatory satellites had its own catalogue of detected and observed X-ray sources. These catalogues were often the result of large area sky surveys. Many of the X-ray sources have names that come from a combination of a catalog abbreviation and the right ascension and declination of the object. For example, 4U0115 plus 63, 4th Uhuru catalog, Ra equals 01 hour 15 minutes, Dec equals plus 63 degrees, 3S1820 to 30 is the SAS3 catalog, XO0748 676 is an Exosat catalog entry, Heal 1 uses H, Aerial 5 is 3A, Ginger sources are in GS, general X-ray sources are in the X-catalog
of the early satellites, the Vela Series 10 ray sources have been catalogued. The Uhuru X ray satellite made extensive observations and produced at least four catalogues, wherein previous catalog designations were improved and relisted 1 ASE or 2 ASE 1615 plus 38 would appear successively as 2 U 1615 plus 38. 3 U 1615 plus 38, and 4 U 1615 plus 3802, for example. After over a year of initial operation the first catalogue, 2 U, was produced. The third Uhuru catalogue was published in 1974. The fourth and final Uhuru catalogue included 339 sources, although apparently not containing extrasolar sources from the earlier OSO satellites. The MIT OSO 7 catalogue contains 185 sources from the OSO 7 detectors and sources from the 3U catalogue. The third Aerial 5 SSI catalogue designated 3A contains a list of X-ray sources detected by the University of Leicester's Sky Survey Instrument on the Aerial 5 satellite. This catalogue contains both low and high galactic latitude sources and includes some sources observed by Hayao 1 Einstein, OSO 7, SAS 3, Uhuru, and earlier, mainly rocket, observations. The second aerial catalogue, designated 2A, contains 105 X ray sources observed before April 1, 1977. Prior to 2A, some sources were observed that may not have been included. The 842 sources in the Heiau A1 X ray source catalogue were detected with the NRL Large Area Sky Survey experiment on the Heiau 1 satellite, when EXOSAT was slewing between different pointed observations from 1983 to 1986. It scanned a number number of X-ray sources 1210. From this the EXOSAT Medium Energy SLU Survey Catalogue was created. From the use of the Gas Scintillation Proportional Counter on board EXOSAT, a catalogue of iron lines from some 431 sources was made available. Topic: Specialty and all Sky Survey X-ray source catalogues. The catalog of high-mass X-ray binaries in the galaxy, fourth ed, contains source names, coordinates, finding charts, X-ray luminosities, system parameters, and stellar parameters of the components and other characteristic properties for 114 HMXBs, together with a comprehensive selection of the relevant literature. About 60% of the high-mass X-ray binary candidates are known or suspected be, X-ray binaries, while 32% are supergiant, X-ray binaries for all the main sequence and subgiant stars of spectral types A, F, G, and K and luminosity classes IV and V listed in the Bright Star Catalog BSC, also known as the HR Catalog that have been detected as X-ray sources in the ROSAT All-Sky Survey RASS. There is the RASS DWARF, RASS AK Dwarfs, Subgiants Catalog. 
The total number of RASS sources amounts to approximately 150,000 and in the BSC 3054 late type main sequence and subgiant stars of which 980 are in the catalogue, with a chance coincidence of 2.2%, 21.8 of 980 equals equals see also